Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction. My bones grow weak. I'm forgotten as though I were dead. I've become like a piece of broken pottery. Have you ever had a day like that or maybe a season of your life where you felt like that? The book that we call Psalms is a collection of prayers to God and declarations about God that are written by David, King David, the ancient ruler of Israel. And it's very human, human. David is very transparent. He's honest in what he has to say. His declarations include some of the highest forms of praise to God, but he also says some things that you, you read them and you think, should that even be in the Bible? <laughs> I mean, he, when he writes about his enemies, he, he prays, he asks God to break their teeth out. And uh, even worse. So, he was a man who, if he thought it, he wrote it. Psalms was like his journal. And God chose not to edit this overflow of David's heart as he poured it out in the honesty of his everyday life. And why is that? Why did God leave all of those things in there? One thing I think we can say for sure is that God is saying to us, there is no need to hold back with me because I know what's going on in your heart and mind anyway. Go ahead and say it. Admit it to yourself and to me. When you come to me in prayer, open up, dump the truck, tell me what you are really thinking and feeling. I can handle it, and you need to be honest. Prayer becomes most meaningful to God and most meaningful to us when we drop our guard and when we allow ourselves to express the good and the bad and the ugly of our everyday lives. And as you begin to read through the Psalms, you will notice that several of them start out with these cries of anguish, of hopelessness, much like the first one that we read. How long will you forget me, Lord? Forever? How long will you look the other way when I am in need? How long must I be hiding the daily anguish in my heart? How long shall my enemy have the upper hand? Answer me, O oh Lord, my God. Give me light in my darkness lest I die. David says things like that a lot. And it's because David had a lot of pain and anguish in his life. Some of it was undeserved. David was the anointed king of Israel. That happened when he was very, very young. But the ruling king of Israel, King Saul, went into a jealous rage. He formed a posse to hunt David down and to get rid of him, to kill him. And so David spent many years in his young adult life on the run, running for his life, literally. And he cries out to God and says, God, what is this? I'm confused. <laughs> you said I'm the anointed one of Israel, and here somebody's gunning for me. What is this? And so there was undeserved pain in his life, but there was also pain that was self-inflicted, things that he brought on himself entirely. David was not a stellar husband or father. He was actually pretty bad at both of those roles. And he and his family were a hot mess. Personally, there were times when he was in bad shape, spiritually. And so he cries out in the Psalms in full admission of his sins and his shortcomings, and he's begging for help. Psalm 51 is when he's crying out to God. This is after he committed adultery and then committed murder right on top of that. Oh, loving and kind God, have mercy. Have pity on me and take away the awful stain of my transgressions. Wash me, cleanse me from this guilt. Let me be pure again. I admit my shameful deed. It haunts me day and night. And in the midst of all this mess and honesty, David is described as a man after God's own heart. Well, how can that be? Well, being honest in the expressions of our mind doesn't distance us from God. It brings us closer. In humble honesty, David 
found the help from God that he needed to develop a godly heart. And so we learn from the Psalms that it is okay to admit and to express the downsides of life as they come. Sometimes we feel that as Christ followers, we need to live and reveal only a Facebook life. And what's that? Well, that's when everything is awesome. We go awesome places. We listen to incredible concerts, and we eat outrageous food, and we go on vacations that are unbelievable, and we smile, and it's perfect, and it's great. That's Facebook, right? How often do you go on Instagram and post a picture of yourself when you get up in the morning first thing? <laughs> Doesn't happen. And so when we get a, a steady diet of that, if we spend a lot of time there, we can get the impression that that's how life is for most people. And what's wrong with me? Because my life isn't like that, and I'm certainly not going to tell anybody about it. And so when we have those exchanges that Josh was talking about, hey, how you doing? That's kind of a hello. It's today, isn't it? <laughs> We're not expecting anybody to really tell us how they're doing. You can tell by their tone and the voice. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great too. And even if I'm doing terrible, I'm not going to tell you. Because first of all, I don't think you're interested. I think that would weird you out if I actually stopped and told you. But secondly, we might stop and think, I don't know if I could trust you with something so personal as to how bad my life is right now. I don't want to be thought of as a loser or a whiner. I don't want to be judged for what's going wrong in my life right now. I, I don't know how people who live Facebook lives would regard me because mine just isn't that way. So I think I'll just keep the cards close to the vest and not tell anybody. There's too much risk involved in being that open. And after all, even when it comes to communicating with God, should, should a good Christian be crying out to God in hurt and pain and confusion and even anger? Can we tell God such things? Is that appropriate? I mean, shouldn't it all be praise and thankfulness and, okay, the list of stuff that we want, but after that, aren't we supposed to just kind of Forget the pain and say, oh well, all things work together for good. Count it all joy and just suck it up and go on because there is no negative thinking allowed in the Christian life. Well, according to Psalms, we evidently have full permission to get it all out there in the open and look at it and deal with it and find some help. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I'm faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long is this going to last? When pain happens, it's a good idea to do something about it, to get some help. Now, it used to be in the old days that when I experienced physical pain, I could, I could ignore it. I could just go on and in a day or two, it cleared up. That doesn't work for me anymore, as good as it used to. It's good that I acknowledge that and do something about it. And the same thing is true when it comes to emotional pain and spiritual hurt and anguish. To acknowledge it and to find some help for it. It's just as good and healthy to concede to God, even if we are confused, even if we are just flipping, flying, angry at God, to tell Him that, because that's when He can come to us and say, all right, now we both know where you're at, and we can deal with this. And it's also good to be able to do that with a good, trusted friend who understands and who can offer the right kind of compassionate support. And most people, when they finally do that, when they finally open up and share what's, what's going on inside, they say, that felt so good to finally quit pretending and to talk about this. It's good to express the overflow of the heart and mind as David sets the example for us in the Psalms. It's okay to hurt. He told the whole country 
how he was feeling and what he was thinking. He set it to music and they sang about it. He was maybe the first sovereign ruler that tweeted out to his entire nation. And so how are, are you doing this morning? How are you doing? Now I'm not fishing for bad news. I'm not assuming that everybody's life is falling apart this morning. But there's some struggles here. And what I hope we can do is to begin bringing to the surface in honesty the reality of our lives so that we together with God and with each other can begin to deal with those things. One area of life that we rarely talk about in church is the anguish of mental health struggles. It is not a rare thing at all for people to have illnesses of the mind that bring chronic darkness and anguish to their lives. It can manifest itself in a variety of different ways and it crosses all lines of age and demographics. Many teenagers and even some young children struggle with mental health issues. I want to show you a montage of a few of the ways that mental issues come to the surface in the lives especially of young teens. I am one in five. One in five is an agency here in our community that is a, a resource help to people who struggle with all of the things that you just heard. It's called one in five because one in five adults experience a mental illness in a given year. 20% of youth ages 13 to 18 live with a mental health condition. One in 25 people live with a serious mental illness. 10.2 million adults have simultaneous mental health and addiction disorders. Depression, clinical depression is the leading cause of disability nationwide. And what do all those statistics mean? They mean that almost everyone in this room has struggled with or is struggling with one of these issues. Or you know someone and love someone who is dealing with some of these things. The Psalms seem to be an almost perfect mirror reflection of what people with mental illnesses are thinking and feeling at times. Here's a testimony of one person who has struggled with mental illness. I remember reading Psalm 88, and I was shocked by how I identified with it. In some ways, it seemed like the writer of the Psalm might have experienced depression just like mine. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I'm overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit in the darkest depths. That is a very dark place to be, isn't it? And this was a person who was struggling with clinical depression and anxiety disorder. Now, I'm not a licensed counselor or anything close to that, so I don't want to make this a clinical discussion. But I can accurately and appropriately say this, that we need to try and understand mental illness and drop any stigmas that are attached to it and educate ourselves so that we can help each other when mental illness strikes within our church family and within our own families. I asked someone who has struggled with clinical depression to say some things about it that might be helpful for us to know this morning. Here's what was said. One helpful thing for people to know is that it's not a choice. It's the difference between being healthy and sick. Not just down or in a bad mood or in a funk. Now that I am through that season in my life, which was nearly impossible for me to see that I could get better, I can see more clearly how sick I was. And when I describe what happened to me, the simplest explanation is that I was really sick. The word depression can have so many meanings and associations like, I'm so depressed, I have to work this weekend. Yeah, that's not the same thing. 
as clinical depression. People use it as a feeling, and for me it was more a state of being. It didn't come and go. It was constant and oppressive, and from the moment I woke up, it was there. Sleep was my only escape, and that was a challenge too and very hard to come by. I would write down how I was feeling sometimes, and here's one entry I found that summarizes that time in my life. There is so much pain in my mind, and I feel trapped. I'm afraid of my mind, but I am there all the time, and it feels like I'm in a horrible nightmare, and it feels like my life has been taken. And it sounds dramatic, and even reading it now sounds extreme, but that is exactly how I was feeling, and there were so many times I would be on my face crying and praying to God. And so how can we help each other? How can we help each other? when we're in the midst of something like this. Well, first of all, realize that it is an illness. Mental disorders, mental illness is an illness. It's not something that a person can logically think their way out of because if they could, they would, and they're exhausted from trying to do that. And one thing that is, there are so many well-meaning things that are said, but they aren't helpful when they're said. And one of them is when we say to someone who is clinically depressed to say, You just need to think happy thoughts. (laughs) You need to make a list of all the things in life that you can be happy about. They've tried that. (laughs) And it doesn't help. And that can be quite discouraging to have that said to you. Be careful of telling someone who's struggling with a mental disorder. Be careful of saying, well, you are under attack by Satan. Satan can use any hard time in our life to do a lot of things that aren't good. But to suggest to someone with a mental illness that they are in the clutches of demonic oppression can be absolutely terrifying. And they do not need to hear that on top of everything else that they're dealing with. Christian people, good Christian people, suffer from mental illness. And it's not a sign of spiritual weakness. And one of the greatest testimonies to Christian faith is when someone who is in the dark place that we're describing here, when they are willing to still tough through it and to hang on to God, desperately hang on to God, tenaciously continue in their faith, that is a tremendous witness and testimony to their love for Christ. So those are kind of the negatives. What, what are the positives? What can we do and what should we do to help someone? My friend says this, one thing... One thing that helped me when, was was when people would one thing that helped me was when people would just sit with me in my pain or hold my hand while I cried. It was painful for me to see happiness, and I think because I was in so much darkness and was unable to feel joy or, or anything but misery, knowing that people were praying for me was a huge blessing. And people got together and prayed with me in person. And that was really comforting. And turning to the Psalms seems to be a great source of comfort to people in times of desperation. Psalm 22 is a favorite of hurting people. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why do you refuse to help me or even to listen to my groans? Day and night I keep on weeping, crying for your help. But there is no reply. Where are you, God? Where have you heard that before? That was a cry of Christ from the cross on the worst day of his eternal life when he was desperate and alone and filled with grief because he was carrying the burden of the weight of the sin of the world. And he says, God, where are you? And where did he turn? He turned to the Psalms as the perfect expression of of what was happening in his heart and his mind and his life at that moment. And that psalm goes on to plead with God for rescue from the dark place, to plead for God to show up and to express hope that God has always answered in times past and he will in this circumstance too. The praises of our fathers surrounded your throne, God. They trusted you and you delivered them. You heard their cries for help and you saved them and they were never disappointed when they sought your aid. Oh Lord, don't stay away. Oh God, my strength, hurry to my aid. Rescue me from death. 
spare my precious life. And he did. As Christ cried out, God did eventually come to him. In the throes of death and in the throes of darkness, God came to Christ and the Spirit of God raised Christ back from the dead and his joy was restored to him. It happened with Christ. God has done it for so many and he promises to do it for us. Oftentimes not as quickly as we wish he would, but he does. I've had dark chapters in my life. I have not had mental illness that I know of, but I've had struggles. And I had a particular time that lasted for a couple of years, a while back, and I found myself being very drawn to the Psalms. And I knew that in my old Bible that I had marked down a psalm, that that was it. As I read that psalm, I said, there it is. That is, that is how I feel right now, and that is what I'm dealing with right now. And I marked it. And so as I was preparing this sermon, I got the Bible out, and I said, I want to see which one that was. And I went leafing through, and I found it. And it was Psalm 88. That's where I was, in a very dark place. But then I flipped over a page to Psalm 89. <laughs> and I had marked that too because that was the day that the clouds opened and the hurt was lifted and my life and my joy was restored to me and I wrote it down. Psalm 89, March 27th, 1991 is when God finally showed up in a way that was tangible to me. He'd always been there. He'd never left. But that's the day the cloud lifted. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. I cried out to God for two years, God, please help me. And he did. And I found the expression of all of that, the good, the bad, the ugly, and finally the praise was there in the Psalms. And so let's understand today that it's okay to hurt. You will hurt at some time or another in life. That's not some betrayal of a promise that God has gone back on with us. We all live in the same world, believers and unbelievers. It's the same world. And Jesus said, in this life, you have tribulation. It will happen. But he goes on to say, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world and I will never abandon you. It's okay to hurt and to express that hurt to God and to seek his help and to admit that pain to others and not to everybody, not to everybody. It's not everybody's business what's going on in your private life. But there can be a somebody, somebody who knows, who gets it, who understands, who can be there for you. And it's a very good thing to share your hurt and your pain with somebody who carries the Spirit of God within them that can reach out to you in the love of Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you through them. That's a very valuable friend. Is it okay to admit struggles to unbelievers? <laughs> yeah, if we're going to be honest about life, we need to do that. For them to finally see, what do you know? Christians live in the same world that, that we do. They live, in, they live in my world. They live the kind of life I do. And what we can offer is, yes, I hurt just like you do, but I've got some added help that, that you don't, and I'd love to share that with you. That's a gift to unbelievers, to come to them in honesty and not pretend that everything's okay. If somebody opens up to you and says, okay, here it is. You ask me how I am, I'm going to tell you how I am, and I'm not good right now. We need to make sure that the response to that is compassion and concern and care. Certainly no rejection, no judgment, no avoidance. And to remember that one very valuable insight that was shared this morning, and that is this. Hold the advice. Hold the advice and instead hold the hand. Hold the hand and pray. Let them cry. Let them talk and pray. Cry out to God with them and beg for help and beg for mercy. And if you're struggling with a dark time, get it out there. Share. And that's why I'm saying... If you're not sure who or how to deal with that, put it on a card, put it in a box. We will respond to you. Leadership at Parkside will respond to you. We'll get with you 
and help you with that. We have good professional caregivers here at Parkside that can help. There are resources. I would encourage you if you're dealing even with some mental illness or you think you have a mental illness. You know, one of the lies, the tape that plays in the mind of mental illness is this will never get any better. It's always going to be this way. Well, there are never any guarantees about anything with mental illness. But there is help available. And seeking that help can help. And things can get better. And they do. It happens. It can happen. Go to oneinfive.org. It's a place to begin. Wonderful, wonderful helping agency here in our community where you can find all kinds of resources to get started. And go to the Psalms. We, we can go to the Psalms anytime to find an expression of what's going on in life. The good, the up times, the bright times, but also the worst times. It's all there and it really does help to hear those expressions that are the expressions of my heart. Go to the Psalms. And you'll find at the end of these, the cries of anguish that David expresses, at the end there is always this hopeful statement, but God... I know you're there. You always have been and you always will be and I'm not going to give up. I'm going to hang on to you because you are all I have right now. And God comes through. In one way or another, He comes through. And so I'd like to close this morning with an expression out of the Psalms that we can enjoy together, a a, a statement of assurance of the faithfulness and the closeness of God in our lives even when it doesn't feel that way. Let's stand as I read this together. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise Him. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble and He delights in those who put their hope in His unfailing love. God, I thank You. I thank You for this word from Your word today that gives us hope and assurance that even in the darkest times, that it's, it's a good thing. It's a, a healthful thing. It's a godly thing to come to you in honesty and tell you how we're feeling, what we're struggling with. Even when we're confused, when we're aggravated, even when we're angry. God, I thank you that you've accepted me even in those times when I've shouted at you because I'm so angry and so upset. God, thank you for, for being such a good father in those times especially. And so I pray that you would be with all of us today and especially those, I know that there are those today where I've really hit a deep chord. People who are struggling and hurting and maybe feeling hopeless and wondering where you are. God, I pray that maybe there was even just a bright light that went on today to understand a bigger picture and that you are there and that hope can come and things can change. But until they do, that you haven't left. And so, Father, please minister to those folks that's here this morning in a very special way in the midst of their pain. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time together. And I pray that this time can lead to greater healing and help in all of our lives. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.